another episode of the Bulldog Broadcast focused on, you got it, Gonzaga basketball on the field of 68 Media Network. Today's guest, one of the most versatile and unsung players over the last few years at Gonzaga, a former Portland native such as myself, even though I moved to Vancouver in the second grade, bet you he didn't know that. None other than Silas Melson. Silas, how's life these days? It's going all right. Just in Europe, enjoying the world, trying to stay positive during these corona times. So you're playing in Belgium right now. How has COVID affected your season? Uh, and have you guys gotten many games in yet? Uh, it's affected our season pretty drastically. Uh, our first regular season game got postponed to November once all of this happened. And then it got postponed again because – I don't know if anyone else would know, but Belgium was the worst, statistically, was the worst country, top two worst countries in Europe, hit by a coronavirus. So our first game isn't until next Saturday. We've been playing preseason games. So. Oh, wow. Well, hopefully you're doing everything you can to keep yourself healthy and, and prepared and ready to play. What is your role as a professional player on your current team? Because I don't think a lot of people understand the game of college basketball is completely different than professional basketball. Oh, drastically different. Um, on my previous two teams, my previous two years, my role has been the same as this year, just score the ball a lot more. I'm sure I didn't do a lot of that necessarily at Gonzaga, but last season I was in Finland and I was a 20 points per game score this year. I'm supposed to do the same thing. And that's, essentially what my role will be in professional. Have you enjoyed getting a chance to, to see the world be all over Europe playing the game you love? Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've been here for a month and coronavirus kind of put a stall on things, but Belgium, they say, is one of the prime time spots in Europe because we're in the middle of everything. And Brussels is the capital of entire Europe, so that's only about 45 minutes away from me right now. And, you know, last year I was in Finland. year prior I was in Greece and I was in Israel. And both of those countries are very beautiful. Greece was an amazing place to be. I loved going to Athens. So, you know, just this whole experience has, has been really fun. So I've had the many conversations with teammates from Gonzaga or other guys that have played at GU of their – random experiences playing in Europe, whether it was uh, being threatened by an owner that they weren't going to get paid to uh, yeah. Matt Santangelo said an owner ran onto a court and was going to fight an opposing player during a game. Uh, I at one point had an injury and, and I had to do my therapy in the back locker room where nobody could hear me and they put the uh, heat and stem pads on me. And they forgot all about me. And 45 minutes later, I'm still screaming in the, in the training room that my back is on fire. I've got scars on my back from the treatment to this day. What's your greatest experience playing in Europe so far? Well, first of all, I'm not surprised to hear any of those because only in my short three-year career or two and some change, I've experienced a lot of that. Um, Greece is really bad at playing, paying people on time. I played there. Um, but the worst experience, or greatest experience, I shall say, I probably couldn't name one in particular. I did go through a bad payment situation in Greece where I switched teams, and by contract, I was supposed to get paid for the – two months after I left the team, but I didn't see one of those paychecks until July, I think. And I, it was supposed to come to me in January. So, it was, you know, those payment situations are for sure universal in Greece. They, they happen all the time. And to piggyback on what you're saying, the health thing as well, depending on where you play, you can be on your own when it comes to therapy. So I've definitely experienced that. Well, at least you did get that payment because to this day, I'm still missing a payment from a team. I'm not going to yeah. put the name of the team out there, but I was promised a payment upon arrival 
and then passing a physical and then the first payment. Yeah. And I, I never saw one of those. So maybe I need to get you on the, uh, in touch with my agent as well and get that one dialed in. I believe that. I believe it. I want to go back to your upbringing as a, as a basketball player in Portland. And I grew up in Vancouver, but my first, you know, seven, eight years of my life was in Portland. And I can still recite my address, 1622 Northeast 63rd, just off Halsey, okay. over by Madison High School, Rose City Golf Course. Right. You played at Jefferson. Who were your who were the guys that you looked up to in the Portland basketball community? Because quite frankly, there was a lot of good players that, that came before us. Yeah. Well, actually a little off topic. I do remember watching you play. I think it was at um GNSL Pro Am. I was very little. Was it uh, okay, so either it was at the Salvation Army, it was at PCC right there on uh was it uh pcc right by jeff when the yes or it uh, was at the sei center yeah it was it was one of those three i think it was at sal okay. i was really young but you went off i think you might have like 50 or something it was crazy but uh but uh yeah i looked up in portland in particular terrence jones is pretty big in my generation i was an eighth grader while he was a senior and he went to my high school obviously so uh, I looked up to him a lot, and shoot, not only Portland, there was a lot of Northwest guys, like Seattle people that some people might not even remember, the Noy Overton. Uh, obviously, Isaiah Thomas was up there, because, you know, Kanan used to bring people down all, all the time for his tournaments, and, you know, I got to see, luckily, I got to see all the people, like, you know, Tony Roten, Terrence Ross, Kevin Love, remember him at Lake Oswego, and it was true, when I was young, you know, Kyle Singler in you know, at Medford and Lake Oswego uh, championship games were going crazy at a, it's not Austin, but whatever it was called at the time at U of O. So, you know, I got a great experience actually with basketball, just watching, you know, future pros come up. Some really good names that you mentioned there, both guys that made it to the NBA and others that, uh, such as yourself, playing in Europe. Right. But you won a state title in 2014. For Jefferson and it, it's Matt Court at the University of Oregon. It was my favorite college basketball arena of all time. It might even trump the old kennel in Spokane, even though people are not going to be happy with me saying that. But you you won a state title. Tell us about that because if I remember right, you had like seven guys in the yeah. state title game, right? And you yeah, went yeah. you were absolutely nuts. With like yeah, actually we won two state titles. I won my junior year as well. But the senior year, um like eight of our players got suspended for uh, undisclosed reasons. <laughs> but, uh, they um, they got suspended the day before the game. So we ended up with six guys, and the sixth guy was a freshman. And um, basically, we came out on fire. I remember um, I had a teammate, Kadeem Strickland. He was a very good point guard, especially in high school. But uh, – I watched the game actually like four weeks ago just for fun. But me and him scored like out of the first 38 points, we had like 34 of them combined in like the first 10 minutes of play. And you know, the only thing I remember from that game is just when the news got out that we only had six guys, you know, everyone was like, oh, Jefferson is going to lose a state title, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we weren't the front runners anymore or the, um, we weren't the uh, old, whatever you call it, not the underdogs. We were we weren't the favorites anymore, and I just remember that lit a fire under all of us. And then it was a one of my greatest memories was reading an article after it because we were all up at like four a.m. the next day and we seen a morning paper come out and it was just the six of us holding hands before the game and you know it all touched us. Well, you got it done twice, two state tournament titles. You were the player of the year coming out of high school. But you made the decision to go to Gonzaga. Was that an easy decision? And what was that process like for you? Because it's different for everybody. Um, it was, I wouldn't say it was easy because um, I had um, my final two schools. I was considering, well, first I really wanted to go to Oregon, but they offered me a scholarship way late. 
So I didn't want, I, you know, I, they obviously didn't want me as bad as I wanted them. But U-Dub was ironically, you know, the, going head to head with Gonzaga right there. But I think, I think my senior year, I think it was the year with Kelly and Elias, they were number one. Was that 2013? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, they were number one. And I was like, wow, the number one team in the country wants me to play for them. And I did more research on them. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's the perfect school for me. I went, and then after my visit, it kind of solidified it for me. What assistant coach was it that kind of ran point on your recruiting, or was it Coach Few? I know I would imagine it would have been Brian Michelson because he's from the Portland area. You guys probably know a lot of the same guys, but who was it that kind of took the lead in your recruiting? Uh, Donnie D, actually. I mean, oh, B really? Mike, yeah, B Mike, they were kind of both there, but Donnie D, Donnie D was, um, Donnie D was first one off me a scholarship. It was, he came to a, a practice. With, at Jeff, which really wasn't even a practice. We were, like, just playing pickup, and he stopped the whole pickup, and he was like, hey, hey, come here, come here. <laughs> and he's like, he was like, yeah, uh, blah, blah, blah. He went to offer you a scholarship. And I was like, wow, what, that quick? And then late, later on after that, B. Mike started to follow up. Then Tommy poked his head in. Coach Few came to a few games. And, you know, I was told, I don't know if this was recruitment trick or not, but I was told that. Coach View at the time wouldn't necessarily come to a high school game regular season because obviously it's during the season. And then he came in one of the mines, and I was like, okay, he must really want me to come, and that played a big role in it. You get to Gonzaga. You're, you're part of uh, a pretty good recruiting class. I believe you came in at the same time with Josh Perkins. You were planning on redshirting. You guys are going back to the East Coast. You're playing in Madison Square Garden. Josh breaks his jaw, and now you pull your red shirt. I remember thinking, man, that would be a tough spot to put a young kid as a freshman in a decision spot. Do I pull my red shirt and start playing, or do I hold fast to red shirting throughout the whole year? What was that decision-making process like, and, and was it completely yours? Um, it was definitely a tough decision. I think um... – it was a little bit of jerk reaction by myself and by the coaching staff, which I don't hold them again to it at all. We all we talked about it multiple times during my career. But um the whole experience though, like you said, that was very kind of nerve wracking because at the time I was only eighteen and then they like they tell me, Oh, because you know, when you redshirt you're just at the hotel, you do your workout, that's about it. And you're like, Oh, we need the game plan for uh I don't know, I think it was a semifinal game at Madison Square. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's like, <laughs> so like, you know, I was definitely, um, definitely, I was definitely a little bit nervous the night before, but I do remember once I got onto the court, you know, I was on the court with guys that played, that were very experienced college players. So it was like, it's kind of easy. I remember my first shot went in, which made it a lot easier. And it was a very easy transition. You go from, I'm sure you played at Irving Park in Portland growing up, the SEI Center. Your first college game is at Medicine Square Garden, but then you got to play in a Final Four in front of, what, like 75,000 people? Yeah. What was that experience like checking into the game with – just in that atmosphere? To be honest, I didn't even look in the stands during the game because I didn't want to because it was, it was so many people. I remember – um we came out there for the first time in Phoenix and we went and shooting around and we actually seen how big the stadium was. And we were like, wow, we probably look like ants in front of all these people. Like it was huge. So, you know, as far as like playing in actual games, I did, I tried not to think anything of it. I didn't even look into the stands. I think the only, I think I had tunnel vision. Like I seen our bench and then the family section that was right behind our bench and then the alumni was behind there too. So it was like, that's all I needed to see because that was always going to be with me during that whole time anyway. But it was, it was definitely a crazy crowd in there. I remember the, um, when the championship game started to get on the line a little bit, you know, this crowd started getting loud, you know, both sides of it were chanting at each other. It was, it was a crazy experience. Have you gone back and watched that game tape 
And, and I think it was Kennedy Meeks had the ball in his hand. He touched the baseline out of bounds. It was out. It was out of bounds. It should have been Gonzaga ball, no questions asked. Have you gone back and watched that game film and, and gotten frustrated at that play or any other bad foul calls? Nope. I haven't, I haven't even looked. I looked at that game for like the first five minutes. And I remember, and then once I, look at, once I looked at it, the flashback started coming. I was like, wow, we jumped on these dudes quick. We were ready. I think Josh had a crazy first half. Uh, Zebo was doing Zach things, but, you know, the refs, I didn't watch this again, but I do remember the refs, you know, blowing their whistle a little too much, and they ended up taking him out of the game. And then funny that Kennedy Meeks play, at the time, I didn't even know what happened. If I did, I probably would have tried to, you know, yell at the ref a little more or something. But I just remember getting on Twitter after and a bunch of mentions in that picture. There was a picture of it when he was out of bounds. I was like, oh, that could have changed the game ultimately. But, yeah, I don't I don't know when I'll get myself to watch that game because they were like, we were so close to that championship. And, you know, and Nigel ended up messing up his ankle at the end as well. So, you know, we were this close. Yeah, I, I can only imagine not want, wanting to watch that game. My, my senior year, I couldn't get, go back yet. I still haven't gone back and watched the first round loss that we had to Wyoming uh, right. when we had such a great season. But the end of the season is always difficult as a player because you're no longer with your guys. You're no longer, you know, taking direction from the coaching staff. Do you remember – that feeling um, because Nigel went to the NBA, um, Zach Collins went to the NBA. There was such a difference from that year to the next, even though you guys were very successful the, ne the following year. Do you remember what the feeling was like in the locker room and what Coach Few's message was? Yeah, well, Coach Few, he's very good at um, post-game, post-season reaction because um, – and, and during the offseason as well, I think, obviously, he's very experienced. I think he knows that after a game or after directly after the season, there's a lot of emotion that you have. So, like, you kind of want to be careful with the things you say or the things you do. And after every game, Coach Few, win or lose, I've never experienced him you know, cuss us out or anything like that. He might have some hostility in his voice, but he will always say, if we beat a team that we should have beat by 40, he'll always say, oh, well, you know, at least we got the job done. And then at practice the next day, he might roast you. <laughs> but right after the game, right after the game, you know, there's too much emotion. So to answer your question, you know, during that transition, right after the season, it was definitely um, different because, you know, over my two years prior, I didn't have, you know, First round freshman, uh, J three entered his name. Nigel entered his name. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I never experienced all that. So it was definitely a different view. I think it was a. Uh, it made me turn up personally more because I knew that I was going to have to have a bigger role this season after that. One of the things I think that makes Gonzaga so special for guys who've played there is the relationships that you develop with your teammates at the time. Um, but you also develop relationships uh, with guys that either played before or after you, and that's one reason we're having this conversation now is because you, you, you love the game of basketball. You love being a part of GU. I'm going to ask you really quick. I'm going to give you a name of a guy that you played with. I want a first word or phrase that comes to mind about that guy. Okay. Nigel Williams-Goss. Workhorse. He's always in the lab. Shemek Karnowski. Hungry. He's always eating, literally. <laughs> <laughs> What's his favorite food then? Shemek's favorite food. I don't know what it is, but I know when it he does order food, it's in a large lump sum. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Pangos. Um would say workhorse, but I already said that. Shooter, he's definitely locked in at all times with his jump shot. Uh, J3. Faithful. He's faithful to everything he does. He's faithful to family, his God, his craft. It's, it's showing right now. He's flourishing. 
Rem Bacamus. Ooh. There's a lot. Uh, funny, loquacious, uh, everything. I remember on my visit, he ended up taking over the lead because he's that kind of guy, outgoing. Maybe that's what I should say. Josh Perkins. Um, my brother. Funny, outgoing. A lot. I can say a lot about him. <laughs> <laughs> and how about Coach Mark Few? One word to describe him. One word? Can I use two? Sure. Go for it. Awkwardly, awkwardly awkward. That's what Coach Few is. Because <laughs> he's not awkward, but in an awkward way, it's awkward, if that makes sense. It makes complete sense to someone who's been around the program for quite a while, like I have myself. Well, Silas, I appreciate the time. It's been great uh, to hear some of your experiences and stories and, and hearing you reminisce about your teammates and friends. Wish you nothing but the best of luck this year over in Belgium. And uh, one last thing is go Zags. Yes, sir. Go Zags. Go Zags.